All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. As you all know, um, I'm always trying to stay on top of things that are happening out there and making sure that I provide information for you all that can help you in your day-to-day -day activities. So for this month, I decided I would talk to you all about some of the challenges or situations that can come up in the home. And together, I can tell you what my solutions um, were when these things happened to me but you all may also have some answers or some solutions that we can talk about and share with each other. So the first thing I wanted to do is our initial contact with that client is usually when we go out to do the initial assessment and that's the RN for most of you. If you have an in-home aid agency where you have an RN on staff, or if you don't, then it's your service supervisor. But someone goes out to that home to make sure that everything is to see how it looks, to see the environment that your aides are going to be working in. So this is where you initially can look to see what kinds of things may be of concern later. So initially, when you walk up to that home, I have a picture of this house here. This house really reminded me of one of my clients' homes out in Franklin County. So I was really cheerful when I saw that picture. But initially when you first drive up and you get out of the car, ask the RN or the service supervisor, you're doing exactly what your employees are going to do when they arrive at that home. And not only are you observing for what is affecting the client, you're observing for what's happening to the employee that you're sending there. Because as an employer, you're also responsible for the safety of your employees. So you're trying to see, is there adequate parking? Where do they need to park? Or is there a broken driveway? When you go up the steps, are the steps rickety? All of those things you are observing for safety reasons. As I said, for your client, as well as for your employee. And then once you enter the home, you want to look to see if it's cluttered. All of those things are important. You're looking for, when you think about false risk, you're looking for scattered rugs. You're, you're just looking at how safe that home is. And your employees can also slip on those things as well. If there's a rug that's not stable and they're carrying things in, in their hand. Just making sure that everything is safe in both situations. And if it isn't, you can go ahead and address that right away before your employee gets there. You can address it for the client or with the family, but that's where the initial uh, deal takes place. One thing that I always saw that could be a potential problem is when there were other people living in the home and not necessarily the family caregiver, but other people such as a niece or nephew or grandchild or grandchildren that can sometimes bring up situations where if you cook for the client, are they thinking that you'll cook for the entire family? Laundry can be a major concern when you do the laundry. Are you, is all the laundry in one big basket and you're having to, that someone is thinking you're going to do the laundry for the entire family. Those are things that I had to diffuse from time to time. Now, keep in mind, you are there to care for that client. If it's a whole house and the client has their own bedroom, that's the space you need to really keep clean or the area that they normally sit in, in the living room. It's not your job to clean that entire house, wash everyone's clothes, wash everyone's dishes. I recall a situation that we had with a client where her daughter had a number of children and she would bring the laundry over on laundry day and expect our aide to wash those clothes. Of course, we had to make sure that that was not an expectation. It was a contentious situation. Also, sometimes family members will come over and cook large meals. And because they know the aide is coming the next morning, they may leave the dishes. 
So those of you all are probably run into some of these, but those are just things where you as the owner, manager, nurse, you may have to diffuse these situations. When you first start out with a client, you want to make sure that you let them know what who's going to supply something as simple as cleaning products. I have a, a document that I would get my clients to sign on intake. And it would say that if we need cleaning products to clean the bathroom, wash the dishes, whatever, that is the client's responsibility because we are not a cleaning service. Sometimes a cleaning service will bring those things in, but in home care, we don't do that. Now, as far as the gloves, you should supply the gloves and the mask. I didn't put the mask down. Gloves and mask, that is the responsibility of the agency to supply that. The client will supply the cleaning products and personal care needs, I'm talking about things like chucks, pads, diapers, lotion, soap, any of that stuff, that is to be supplied by the client because we don't supply that. Now, you may think that a client would really understand that, but it is such a good idea to cover that when you go in so that it's not a misunderstanding. I had developed a document that with a lot of these things in it because I kept seeing that they were coming up over and over again. And so on admission, I would go down this list of steps or things that I had isolated that I knew could potentially cause um, some concern later. And I would have the client to initial that we went over that and that they understood what their responsibility was. And then let's talk a little bit about while you're providing care for that client. After you've done the assessment, you've seen all of those things that need to be taken care of, and then you're going to start in a caregiving role. You pick the right aid to go there, and he or she is going to go there and provide care for that client. There can be situations with property that is missing. And it can be more of a concern if you have other individuals in the home, because those other individuals may be responsible if there is property missing. And because you have someone that's coming in the home that's new and hasn't been there before, it's, it's highly likely that they may be blamed for it. So just keep that in mind. You may have to go in and diffuse a situation like that. I at one time had a situation where a client thought that their wedding rings were missing. Well, they were just had fallen down up under something and we were able to find it. But during the time that they were, quote, not in sight or able to be seen, I went to the home, I spoke to the family, and I let them know that all of the employees that I sent there had been screened. They were, all of them were employees that had worked for me a long time and I, I knew their character. And so I let them know, you know, we will continue to look. And if you don't find it, we will take care of it because let me just stop and mention this. You all should have a liability power policy for your agency, insurance policy. The other thing that you can do, and it is not that much more expensive is you can have a bonding policy. And it's a, it's a slightly additional amount, but it makes your agency bonded up to certain amounts if something like this happened. My bonding policy went up to $5,000 per incident. So should it, you know, had it been a situation where this lady's rings were missing and my aides got blamed for it, I could have brought in my bonding policy and up to $5,000, it would have covered it. I had that bonding policy added to my liability for years and years. I never had to use it, but that is just something to keep in mind. It also looks great on your website and on your business cards when you say that we are bonded and insured. That is really comforting to clients. Sometimes if other people are in the home or even the client, they may make inappropriate advances toward your employees. I also went through this with a client um, she and her daughter lived together and we had a, you know, great relationship taking care of them. They were a joy to take care of, but she had a son that lived out of town and he came to town to visit from time to time. He was retired. So he would come and stay for a couple of weeks. Well, after we started providing care in the home 
on the next visit when he came, he was inappropriate with my aid. Um, if she was making the bed or bending over or something like that, he would come too close to her. It was, it was a situation. So I worked with other family members and they assisted with diffusing the situation, but this can happen. There was also another case where I had some employees working in a building where there were senior citizens and someone who was in a management position would get too close to my employees. So I had to take care of that as well. Didn't think that I would have to. And I finally had to say to that individual, um, if this continues, I will have to contact my attorney and I will contact my insurance agent because, you know, I was bound to keep my employees safe. We're bound to do that. After I said that to the person, it did finally stop. But it was a, a big stressor for me that I had to go through that. And you all may run into that. You are responsible for keeping your employees safe, free of sexual harassment, verbal abuse, all of that. You are responsible for that as much as you are for the clients. Also keep in mind, we are agencies that have the duty to report. So that means if we suspect abuse, physical abuse, if we see mental abuse, if we suspect that there is financial abuse, we should report that. The way that your aides would, would do that is they would go come to your RN or your agency director. And because you have a license, you have a duty to report that up the line. When you're in that home, whatever's going wrong that is not proper, that is not correct, you should report it and make sure that it stops. Now, before you go out and report it to Adult Protective Services, you wanna do all of your research. You wanna to talk to other family members. And if you're really upfront, you want to look at both sides of it. You wanna to talk to the client. You wanna even talk to the perpetrator if you can, but you wanna do everything you can so that when you, and if you have to go forth for something like this, that it's not a false alarm and that you truly understood the situation. Sometimes I noticed this, this would happen sometimes in, during the summer. We would be caring for a grandmother. The kids were out of school. Well, grandmother was the babysitter for her daughter's children. And the grandchildren would come over every day even though we were there helping this client to, with their personal care and all of those things, there would be a couple of kids in the house. One of the clients I remember caring for, her daughter brought, brought a small baby that she would take care of. So that's when you're gonna have to step in, you know, does this client really need this care? Or are they asking your aides to participate in that? This is just something where you as an agency owner and as an advocate for your employees, you need to step in and diffuse those situations and make sure that they're not being taken advantage of or that your employees are not being asked to do things. That's not on the plan of care. As I have mentioned in the past, I am happy to provide this information for you all every month to give you whatever I uncover that may be helpful to your agencies. But before you go and make any changes to anything in your agency, your rules, regulations, make sure that you check with DHSR if it's rules and regulations or any state or federal resources, and also your legal counsel. Some of the things I talked about today, you may want to consult legal counsel about that. Before you make any major changes, be sure you do that. But I just want to make you all aware of some of the things that can happen as you run this business, because this can really, this is a tough business. It's very rewarding, but it can be very tough. 
So that's what I had prepared for you all today. And I would love to hear your thoughts on it or some of the things that you're running into that maybe we can talk about and discuss. So if you would like to mention something, you can open your mic and, and go ahead. If you can't think of anything, Frank, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Um, well, I'll ask, I, I, I've got kind of two questions. One is, um, you know, that um, when you have two clients in the same house or a couple, how do you kind of designate or determine when it goes to from one rate to a couple's rate? Did, did you have that? And then did you have some criteria for determining that? Because sometimes, you know, there's just not that much to do when they first start. And so, I mean, you know, you're not going to charge it right when there's not that much stuff to do. But I was just curious how you handled that. So did you take on both of those clients, both of them as clients, and you have a chart on each one of them? Is that what you're saying? Or did you just make one of them your client and the other one is just in the house? How did you handle that part? Well, I have both. Um, and, and thankfully, the one that has um, both clients is, is clear. Um, and, and so we haven't had any issue with that, but I can see it coming with a couple of others where we started taking care of one. And then really part of the, part of the, the help that we've given is to the spouse who basically needs some respite, you know? And so I mean, if, if the, if the spouse wasn't there, we would have done the laundry and the cooking and, and, um, you know, the, the change in the bed and all that stuff anyway. So, um, you know, we're kind of doing it for both of them. What's, what's the big deal? When, when okay. It- so let, let me just say this. Frank is a private pay agency. So he has a lot of latitude. Those of you that do Medicaid, you are, you're only there to take care of that client and you can't care for anyone else. So Frank, it is going to be up to you or any private pay agency as to how you're going to handle that. Some agencies will charge an extra rate per hour. Or if you're to be there with client A, who's your primary client for eight hours, and then there's an hour's worth or two hours worth of additional things that you're doing for the extra client, maybe you add on a couple of hours. But it is up to you. As you said in the beginning, they don't need a lot of help. And then it starts. So you're going to have to gauge that. And that that is really important for the employee that's working there. It's what are they willing to do? Are they feeling uh, that I'm getting the same rate per hour, but now I'm giving two baths? You know, I am fixing this. I'm doing whatever. So that is, I think the thing that would really make you check to see if you need to get additional funds to compensate the employee and not let them feel like they are being dragged down or not being compensated for the work they're doing and the time that they're spending. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add to that or have you all handled that in a different way? Sorry, I have a different question. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if you can be of assistance. Um, when doing private pay uh, clients, um, we know things are not that easy for people to pay out of pocket, but then a lot of people are asking for rates that sometimes are just ridiculous. So I was just wondering if uh, as um, uh, a committee of agencies, how can we really determine what is the going rate and what is reasonable to charge your, your client? I know you have to do initial assessment to see the condition of the patient, what kind of needs so they can, you can set up your care plan for them. Mm-hmm. But really, how best do you think it's right for one to charge the client, not to overcharge them, to have a reasonable um, charges uh, for the service. Okay, so let me just say this. I am. Um, I have a business background 
as well. I am a registered nurse, but I have a business background. And so I suggest that everyone that goes into business, that you do a business plan. Part of that business plan is that you survey your competition. You find out what your competition is charging for the service. Now, there, it's, that's kind of difficult to do, but there is a way to do it. If I wanted to find out what Frank was charging for a certain service, I would create an avatar. My Aunt Jane has dementia and she needs this. She needs a bath three times a week, such and such and such. I want five hours a day, such and such and such. What would your going rate be? Now on the phone, Frank may say anywhere between 38 and such, you know, whatever the rate is. He may give me a range until his nurse comes out. But you all need to find a way to realistically survey your competition. And I just gave you a way to do it. You're going to have to do it that way because the, you're not, when you call them and you go, hey, this is um, Patty Williams and I'm with Home Care Resources. What do you charge for such and such? They're not going to tell you anything. But there is a way that you can find that out. And if you do a business plan, that is the way that you do that. And if you have started your business without a business plan, you can still do that. But you're going to have to do it in the manner that I just presented to you. So there, that way you will find out what your competition is charging. And then you, you don't have to charge the highest or the lowest. You can go sort of in the middle and keep in mind. And when you go in with a client at a certain rate, you do have the option to increase that rate later. But I always would notify those clients at least 90 days in advance. And I'd say as of June 1st, our rate will go to such and such. I've never had a client to leave because of that. Because if you're doing a good job and you're only raising their rates by two or a couple of dollars an hour, they're not going to leave you for that. As far as what you pay your aides, the very same thing. Now, your aides are going to come to you. They're going to tell you what they can get over at another agency. So you'll just have to figure out what to pay. But you need to know what the going rate on the street is. I know it has increased a lot. Medicaid hasn't gone up that much. I know they are kind of stuck in a certain rate. So there's not much you can do there. But if you're doing Medicaid, and of course, I know you're doing private pay, it is even more important that you get a good rate from your private pay clients, because that's when you can really make up some of that that you don't get with Medicaid. Yes, you, 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 you did. Um, I, I have a follow up question to that. Um, so uh, I've just started doing Medicaid recently um for the private pay uh, i used to um give them the the agreement which i got approved by idph during my initial licensure so my question is when you when you flip over to medicaid can you still apply the same um agreement or you have to draw off a new agreement you know, you give your client agreement to sign, um, and usually IDPH approves what you give to them to protect you and to protect your the client as well. So, okay. but for Medicaid, it's a different payer. So, do you have to draw a new agreement indicating the well, the payer is doing something that's different, the services remain almost the same thing? Well, there are a few things that you have to make sure you tell a client. Mostly, it's the same. If you got whatever your paperwork, well, they probably didn't approve any client paperwork. So your clients, there's certain things you have to tell them. You have to give them the complaint line number. Um, there's quite a few things that are related to Medicaid that you have to provide. So I would say you probably do need some updates to your information if you're doing Medicaid. And when you went through the Medicaid approval process, they told you some of those things. However, you need to, you're dealing with QI report and Liberty Healthcare, you need to be sure you keep up with the things that they want every client to know. And it probably is 
a little bit different, or there may need to be some additional things that are not part of your private pay agreement. Okay. So, and since I mentioned QI report and Liberty Healthcare, if you all do Medicaid and you do work with them, please make sure when they have those classes, usually quarterly, and I think they've been doing them online for quite some time, and they may start going back in person. They will have course classes and like a day where everyone gets together and they talk about all the changes, everything that's going on. And that's where they go over things like what I'm talking about right now that's related to Medicaid and you have to do things a certain way. Be sure that you sign up and you go to all of those. I always went. I, I made sure I was there to, to see if I was in compliance and I'd come back and change things if I needed to because they will make changes. So once you get approved for Medicaid, stay up to date on their website. They have information related to that. But I would say that if everything was related to private pay, there may be a few things. It may not be a whole lot, but there's probably a few things that you may need to add. Let me ask one more question if there's no other person asking. <laughs> um, so at what point in the business do you think uh, for a new business to go for um, accreditation, things like CHAP, um, to do the accreditation for your business, at what point? Are you an in-home aid agency? I, I have both um, skilled nursing and in-home agency combined. And you said, how hard is it to get a certification? No, no, no. At what point do you advise uh, a new business to go for certification? Whenever you feel that you have gotten your business um, ready for that. Now, they'll guide you through that process because, you know, there are specific organizations that do that to yeah. get you certified. So I would say it's never too early to contact them and start to figure out what kinds of things they need you to do, because everything has to be in line and ready to go. You've got to have certain procedures in place and go to those agencies and start to. I don't think it's ever too early to do it. You may not go all the way, but start to get your agency set up for certifications. I have a couple of questions, Patty. Okay. Um, the first one is, what do you recommend? I mean, and this may be, maybe I'm overthinking it, but what do you do in situations when you have a private pay client and you're already working in the case and they decide in the middle of the contract that they won't change the hours, the amount of hours that you're supposed to be doing. Do we be flexible with them? Cause they've already, you know, paid you and everything, but then they decide, Oh, I don't need you on two or three nights after all. So you're saying they've already paid you in advance. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. They'll pay me in advance. Just say like they said, they want two weeks of services. Um, mm -hmm. But then they, may have a family member that, that, that decides, oh, I can jump in and help. And so they want to take the two or three days back from you. Do we okay. just refund them or just, um, it, can we put in our contract? Uh, or is, does, is that ethical and professional to say, once you sign up for services, then you know that's what we're going to provide? Yeah, you can, Paris, you can do it either way. You can put that in your contract or you can refund it. Personally, I would refund it because of goodwill. Okay. Because that client may need you later or they have friends that may need you. And okay. so just keep in mind, everything that you all do, they are, when people come to them and they say, oh, I see you had an agency taking care of your mom. What do you think about us taking care of them? You want as much goodwill out there as possible. And as an agency, don't you all get scared that you need that few dollars. If it's $500, $400, sure, you can use it. But just keep in mind that having that goodwill out on the street may bring you more cases, more money. So mm -hmm. I always err on the side of the client is always right. If there is a refund, I would refund it because mm -hmm. I want it to be known as fair and just in my dealings as a businesswoman. Okay. Yeah, I did do that. And it did... Um... <laughs> She did contact me again for another um, post-surgery, um, yes. some help she needed. So, yeah, I just wondered about that. 
And then um, my other question was, I did get approved for CLIA. And I want to know any, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start as far as providing the, you know, the services add on for the agency. I'm not going to do anything until I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. But I wanted to know, was there any information that anyone can share about how do we move forward once you get approved? Because I, now I did get an email saying that the state is no longer reimbursing um, for CLIA, but that we're supposed to still provide the testing since we're an approved site. Did you hear anything about that? No, after we talked about this at a previous meeting, and she's talking about COVID testing. Isn't that what you're talking about, Paris? Yes, it's the so acronym after, for CLIA. Yeah. yeah, so after we talked about this before, I did get in touch with DHSR, and I asked them, was there an additional license or anything? And even the people in charge did not know. And uh, they mm -hmm. said they were going to check with the CLIA group. But Paris, this is my question. What would be the reason that you would do it if you cannot be reimbursed? Exactly. But <laughs> on my application, I also put two other things that I wanted to be able to do. I wanted to do some um, urine drug screening and PPDs. And of course, the nurse would do that. Mm -hmm. But the drug screening, you know, I could be trained to do that or, or another staff. But yeah, I was like, well. I don't yeah. know what the so go thing, back to the clear is. and yeah, that's mm -mm. you all, your volumes are low anyway. You have lots yeah. of expenses, you have to pay an RN, you've got all yeah. this overhead. And so, when you get down to providing a service that you cannot be reimbursed for, I can't see the reason as a business person that you would do that. But right. parents go back to the CLIA organization because they should not be issuing a license for you to do something and they can't tell you how to do it. Right. They should have yeah. some type of training or whatever. But that's the extent of what I know about it. I wasn't able to get much information. I think I found a website and you must have that because you went through the process. Yeah. To so go back to them. They should be able to give you some direction. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, Betty. Hi. Um, my question is, do, do you or anyone else um, have any information on doing the trainings online opposed to having them come into the office and do them? What type of trainings? You're talking about in-service trainings? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I know that there is an organization out there called Care Academy. Is anybody using Care Academy? You are, yeah. Frank. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I, yes, I, um, I, I don't know if I can answer that question, actually, because when, when you asked that, that was, that was a great, that was my first thought. Um, uh, but we do use that for our initial training for our caregivers, and they go through their infection control and um, HIPAA, bloodborne pathogen training. We have dementia module on there. Um, it's it's good. Um, um, and so, is it part of your franchise package? Because Frank is a franchise. It's no. not okay. You can get it. It's, it's pretty affordable. I can't remember exactly what the cost is, but it might be like $3 or something per caregiver per month. And you can activate and deactivate them. So you're not always paying. Um, I think okay, yeah. So yeah. that's good. That's good to know. So I would like to say also when in the beginning, when you start your agency, um, you may want to try to do some of those things and have your nurse do that training initially if you can. However, it's it gets to be kind of difficult. So, um, uh, Crystal, yeah, fact, did you um, have some information on that, Crystal? Yeah, I use Care Academy as well. It's integrated. I think Frankie probably used Clear Care too. So it's integrated into Clear Care, and I'm a franchise as well. The one downside, there's downsides to both. I think to the nurse doing it versus Care Academy is Care Academy. Um, it's an online training, which is super convenient. They can do it from their phone. They can do it from anywhere, but you're tracking these people down. 
Um, and your infection control training is one that they have to have before they go out into the home. And so you bring them into the office, you onboard them, say, great, go do this infection control training. And then they're off into the wild and you're tracking them down, trying to get them to do the darn infection control training. Um, so I would say uh, what I'm starting to do is just do some sort of modified version. Are you in North Carolina? Whoever asked that question? I'm in South Carolina. Okay. Well, in North Carolina, that's one of the ones you have to have before they get out into the home, doing some sort of modified, at least infection control training in the office before they're out. And then they can do all the other ones that aren't necessarily required um, in the online modules. That's what I think I'm switching to because it's just too hard to track people down. Okay. So what I have is I have um, an orientation manual with a test that I provide for my clients. And it has everything in there. And I suggest that clients use that until they get to a point where they can really afford these software packages. Or you can, as you said, Crystal, do a hybrid, you know, use, do some of it in-house or whatever. Because what I thought was so convenient about the way I did it was when I brought that employee in and they filled out their application and all that, I had them do it right then. What Even if I wasn't didn't hire them. They did their paperwork, gave that to me. And I was like, go off with this book and you take this test. So if I cleared them all the way through to hiring them, I had everything that I needed to be able to send them to work. So there's, you know, advantages and disadvantages. I can definitely see later as they have continuing education and all that, it would be better. But when you're looking at because usually if I hired somebody, I needed them to go to work sometimes even the next day or a day or two. So I got everything I could get. And I'm like, OK, once I do this and check their NA registry and of course I was going to do what I had to do with their background. And I had interviewed them. I saw them. They filled out their paperwork. And there's something good about them filling out the paperwork and taking that test. You all, I have discovered that there are still people out here who a borderline illiterate. And sometimes you don't know that until you ask them to read and respond. And you want to know that as an owner. Mm -hmm. Not that you can't hire them. I have hired people like that before. I have manually sat there and talked them through things and talked and they were good caregivers. They were excellent, kind, sweet, cooked. They did everything they were supposed to do. But I saw that that was the issue because I, when I got their test back, it, it just didn't match. And this is what they will say to you. Well, I do have a reading problem. That's what they say. And that's enough for me. I know what that means. But I hired them anyway if I could get them to work and some of them were the best. So oh, um, your, your packages that you did, Patty, did you like draw them up on your own because you're a nurse or did you print them out from somewhere? I drew them up. Well, some of it is information I've acquired over the years, but I basically drew them up myself based on what had to be taught. Because we have mandatory in-service here in North Carolina. We have to teach safety, infection control, bloodborne pathogens. Um, and then, of course, we have to do some form of orientation before we send them out the first time. We have to orient them to the agency. So I have all the mandatory things in there. Over the years, I've added a COVID-19 module. I have abuse and neglect. All of those things that we really want our aides to know before they go out there. And then after they finish the manual and they take the test, then I would talk to them about, you know, any other things that I felt that they needed to know. Any other questions that you all can think of today? Patty, was there a yeah. list for the in-service recommended trainings? Because what I do is I, I'm, I'm like you. I get my my girls going when they when I'm hiring them. I nurse check them off when they're doing the checklist for um, going over the ADLs and IDLs when they're going into the home. And then they do their test. And then if they miss, miss something on the test, my nurse kind of go over the test with them, too. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm, I'm looking at what's more cost effective, too. <laughs> yes, and in the, the beginning, <clears throat> yeah, in the beginning, your agency might not be able to afford these software packages. But, you know, if you have something that they can come in and sit down and look at, 
then of course that would be a cheaper way to do it. And later on, as your agency grows and the mm -hmm. money really comes in and you've managing a lot of people, then you might want to go to something like that. But okay. um, they, as far as what's mandatory, look in your policies and procedures and look at the mm -hmm. rules and regulations. Okay. Now I'll mention this too, the mandatory in-service. Some of you have people that work for you that work in the nursing home or the hospital and they work for you too. And a lot of these things they've gone over, like the infection, some of the infection control, they know about safety, they know about certain things. But there is one thing you have to teach at your agency, and that is blood-borne pathogens. Because they can come and say, I took this over at Wake Med, such and such, even if they took blood-borne pathogens, you have to teach that either on a module as Frank and Crystal are doing or you need to hand them something to read and test them on it. So that's one that, that you have to do. But the rules and regulations or your policies and procedures should have that in it, Paris. So just look that up. And I can, uh, if you get in touch with me, I can give you the list that I have uh, for mandatory in-service, and then you can compare it to what you're already doing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any okay, other questions? Question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, is um, do, do my question to you and I guess to the group is, does anyone have um, an RN um, service that they recommend? And, and what I mean is um, we have a client that is um, going to have somebody coming home from a hospital and they want they, they need medical care. And so that's obviously beyond our scope. As home care agencies, um, and so it's more than home health that they need. They want they want a nurse to to be by their side for a few days. Um, do y'all have any recommendations there, or Patty, any ideas? So I would say they could go to an agency that does private duty nursing. That would be under their scope of services a private duty nursing, and they can provide that service. Also, they probably want to see once they're released from the hospital, if they do need some nursing care, they're probably going to be with a home health agency for a while to get them to a certain point, and then private duty nursing can take over from that. Okay. Does anybody have anybody they've used and recommend? Um, we offer skilled nursing services. I don't know where is the location of the, the patient. Uh, okay, well, Frank, said, why, don't you, why don't you get in touch with him? Did you put your information in the chat? How do you say your name? Ab Abdiodun? Abdiodun, yeah, that's correct. Okay, put your information in the chat and you and Frank talk about that because you may be able okay. to, right. um, to help him. Okay, I have the information on the chat already. Is okay. Um, okay. Holidex Home Health Care Services. Frank, I know another agency that also provides like care management stuff. But I don't know if they do. And and that is what I want you all to do. I don't want you all to consider yourselves competing with each other because I know many of you have sent clients to each other help each other. This is a tough business, and there is lots of business out here right now that is not being covered. And so if you get a client, and this is sort of part of your um, rules and regulations, if you get a client, you can't hold that client for two or three weeks until you find an aid. If you cannot service that client, you need to pass them on to someone and you need to actively do that. There should be something in your admission packet that's called coordination of services. So if you take on a client and you don't have the assistance to provide for that client, you need to go into that section and, and write down, I call this agency, I call that agency, I referred it here, I referred it there because that client is on hold and they're not receiving care and you can't cover it. And hopefully it will be um, an agency that will reciprocate. If they have that situation, they'll send it back to you. But the main thing is to get our clients care and services as quickly as possible. And if we can't do it, we need to pass that along. Well, on that note, um, 
we do need a part-time nurse. <laughs> so if anybody knows of someone who wants to pick up a few extra hours, and it can be a few hours, as few as like um, a half a day, a couple times a week, you know, six hours or eight hours a week, or or even more if they're interested in it, we could, we could, um, we, I don't know if we could go full time, but we possibly could, depending on if, if that's what they wanted and we needed to scope it out. But um, so if anybody needs a part-time nurse and wants to try to go have Caesar um, part-time with it, we'd, we'd love to chat. And I know that nurses are hard to come by. You all know that. So it might be good if you all can share, talk to your nurse to see if maybe they can help Frank out or, or whatever. I see that um, someone asked about the presentation. I will edit this recording and I will put it on uh, our YouTube channel and I'll let you all know when it's available. It will probably be, it'll be a few days because I've got a couple I need to do right now, but we do have a YouTube channel where we put the monthly meetings. So it will be posted. And of course the slides will be on there because it's recorded on Zoom. Any other question? questions? Go ahead. Um, what are you guys paying your nurses and your aides? Because I asked them during their interview, um, what, is, what rate do they want? And they don't seem to know, not my nurses or their aide or the aides. Well, so, I know you said you're in South Carolina. And so it's going to be a little different because we're here in the Raleigh area. Uh, a lot of us are. And um, we know the rate is, is sort of high here. So just keep in mind that your area is going to be different. But I would say if an individual comes in and they ask, they say, I don't know how much I should make, then you should pay them what you think they should make as a business person. I'm speaking as a business person now. Okay. So because most of the time I found I had a section on my application where I asked them what rate did they want or what did they make on a different job. And you should see the huge numbers they would put on there. And I just knew that it wasn't realistic. So most of the time they will give you a high number. So I am surprised that they're not giving you anything. So as a business person, if you have that latitude, that is something that you should determine because they, should, they probably are out shopping for other jobs. And they will let you know that if it's not in line, I'm just surprised that they don't know what they should make or what would be acceptable to them as an employee. Can anyone else address that? Yeah, Patty, um, I know I've heard talk of other people, they pay them like per assessment a fee. And then of course the mileage, isn't that, is that kind of fair if you just put out there I'll pay you $100 or $150 uh, per assessment. For your nurse? For the nurse. For the nurse. Okay, so mm -hmm. let me just say this too. If you have an in-home aid agency, at all times when you have an aid working in the home, you're supposed to have an RN on call. So if you are just working one RN and paying them for an assessment or paying them um, PRN like that, hopefully you have another RN that is always on call when you have an aide that's active in the home. So I just want to add that you all can take that however. So we need an RN on call um, at all times. And do we your aid is call working her? In the home, yes. In North Carolina now, in North Carolina, that is the rule. Okay. Yes, we will have to get creative in how we do that because, I mean, wow, yeah. I mean, I have a nurse that checks in with me um, once a week, X amount of hours. Um, but most of the people work other jobs, so in, particularly during the day. Oh, yeah, that's that's pretty tough. And that's a challenge, too, because mm -hmm. now none of this is relevant right. unless a situation happens. If a situation happens, um, Paris, and your nurse is over at Wake Med doing a 7A to 7P, 
something happens today, she's at work and a nurse is needed and it, the case gets all the way up to a complaint status. When they come out and look at it, they'll say, well, where was the RN when this happened? Why didn't she mm-hmm. do such and such? And then you say, oh, she was, that was her day to work at Wake Med. They will cite you for not having an RN on staff. I've seen mm-hmm. it happen. Oh, I believe it. Thanks for the reminder. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Is this a requirement for private pay as well or only if you accept the Medicaid? In North Carolina, if you're licensed, whether it's private pay or whatever, if you have a license, that is part of your licensure, whether it's Medicaid or private. Okay. All of our agencies are licensed in North Carolina. It used to be many years ago, a private pay agency was not licensed, but now all agencies are licensed. And so that is a licensure rule. Davida, you have a question? Yes, I have a question in regards to the orientation. So how often do you have to hold orientation with your uh, with your employees? And uh, and yeah. OK, so I guess you're talking about their in-service training. Right. Everyone should have in-service training slash orientation up on hire and then annually they're supposed to go back through the in-service training. Now you wouldn't do orientation again, but you would, they have to go back through those courses, those mandatory in-service courses that we talk about yearly. Good time to do that is your employees should get an evaluation annually, yearly or annually, whichever you wanna say. And so a good time to do that is to do their evaluation and have them go back through your in-service training for those mandatory things, safety, uh, infection control, bloodborne pathogens, all of that, TB, those things. So do that. That's part of your um, licensure rules in North and Carolina. The, and the reason I ask, I know the state does uh, something every three months, like an audit. I'm, I, I'm, all of this is new to me. So forgive me if I'm not saying it right, but um, I wasn't sure uh, exactly how that goes, like, um, as far as having things ready for, uh, people from the state. Okay. Um, now I'm not sure what you're speaking about an audit by the state every three months, but for um, home care, you should have a procedure within your agency to do a client record review every 90 days. Oh, that's why I was talking about. Yes, but that is yeah. internal, DeVita. That is not uh, the state doing that. That is within your agency internally. However, it should be documented. And if the state does come to visit you, they would, of course, want to see those and be sure that, that those are being done. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm-hmm. We're just about out of time. Do we have any other questions today? This has been a great discussion. Patty, is that the same thing as the quarterly review? Absolutely, it is, Paris. Okay, okay. That's the quarterly review, and then you do an annual review. Make sure you do your annual review also. You're supposed to do one every quarter, and then annually there's other things you look at, the total agency operations. And as you do those, if you come up with things that need to be corrected, you list them on the sheet and figure out, put down the solution as to how you corrected that. Okay. Okay. At quarterly, I was speaking about with the client. You know how they have to do- No, that's a supervisory visit. Oh, okay. That's called a supervisory visit with each client every 90 days. That should be done for um, in-home aid clients. But if it's a companion, it's a little different. If it's just companion care, you can visit them once every six months and make contact every 90 days, I believe. It's a little bit different. But what I did, if you have both in your agency, I always went to the highest, the most stringent case. If mm-hmm. I knew I had to do all of my in-home aid clients, supervisory visit every 90 days, I did that for my companion clients because it was too much to keep track of. So I would rather do them more than to miss it and have two standards going. But the companion is a slightly different. 
It's not as, uh, as strict if it's companion care, but we know companion care means I'm not bathing them, I'm not dressing them, I'm just sitting there talking to them, playing cards, drinking coffee, whatever. But if you're touching, dressing and bathing that client, that's an in-home aid level client. Uh, oh, that reminded me of a question real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so for the companion, when you're making the supervisory visits, could I send out a uh, person in, in my place to make those visits like a, a supervisor that I, I appoint? Or would I have to be the one to do those visits every time? You're the RN, Davida? Oh, no, I'm not RN, just the owner. I have okay, a companion. So the person that can be the supervisor for a companion is called a service supervisor. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to delegate that to another person, they would need to sign the job description for a service supervisor. Even you, Davida, you need to, as the owner, you need to sign the job description for a service supervisor. And so you all keep in mind, job descriptions are so important. They are going through those things with a fine tooth comb, making sure all the responsibilities are in there. And if you have someone on your staff that is performing a role, they need to have a job description that they are to use as their guidelines and for you to measure them by. And they need to have the proper qualifications for that. Okay, it's two o'clock. Thank you everyone for your help today. Thank you all for coming. I will um, get this up on our YouTube channel and I'll let you all know if, um, if some of you don't know how to find that, just get in touch with me and I will tell you where it is. And we'll do this again next month. We do it the second Friday of every month at 1 p.m. And I thank you all for coming. It's educational for me as well. And I hope that we're providing some information that you all can use in your agencies. You all take care and we will see you next month. And if you need me in the meantime, you all know how to contact me. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Patty. Thank you.